uh, give a warm welcome to Lois Frank. Um, and Lois uh, was a part of ver a very small group of activists in the Kenai Blood Reserve in Southern Alberta uh, that put their, their bodies, their physical bodies, in front of a line of trucks to stop, to stop a fracking operation on their land. And she was one of the three women who refused to end the blockade. And guess what? Arrested on September the 9th of 2011. And their case, these three women's cases, has received international attention and is ongoing. And please welcome Lois Frank. I'm taller, so I can move this thing up. Um, I'm very honored to be here and to be part of this whole movement. Um, I could give you a lot of theory. I teach it at the University of Lethbridge as well, and I, I think I'll tell you my story and you know why we did what we did and what happened to us, because I think, you know, that's, uh, you know, people can relate to that. Um, by the way, I was a backup for Maryland, Chief Maryland, today, and I thought, well, that was kind of unusual because yesterday, as we were on our way to listen to the speakers, my two friends here, Kathy and Lori, we were walking, we were following these people, and this guy asks me, are you Elvis's backup singer? <laughs> and I, you know, we were following him along, and, but there was an Elvis concert somewhere <laughs> and I said I don't have my microphone but I've I, I kind of know jailhouse rock <laughs> and you know I've I found myself in all kinds of unusual circumstances uh, in during this whole time and you know I've it could be tra seen as tragic or you know pitiful, but I, we chose not to see it in that light. You know, as Bill mentioned yesterday, you got to be you can't be 22 doing this because these poor young people need their, you know, they, you, they could get a criminal record and things like that. So it's going to take people who are a little more seasoned. I won't say old <laughs> than that because you know you almost have nothing to lose. You know. Because I've been there, I've done that. Um, uh, I'm, you know, when you introduced me, <laughs> I'm tired of being introduced as the accused. Because <laughs> <laughs> I went to court seven times. But I'll, I'll back up a bit. Um, um, I, I too grew up on the blood reserve. You know, I grew up, went through a lot, a lot of the same things that a lot of my. Uh, people in the community throughout Canada, you know, they, I find it kind of interesting, just as an aside, that people are really worried about the economy, they're worried about, you know, s spending this money on gas and things like that. In our community, there were no jobs. <laughs> we had no cars, so we didn't have to worry about, you know, gasoline. <laughs> Food was another matter. It was scarce. Sometimes our dads would go hunting, but we always ate, you know, we didn't worry, you know. And today, you know, we're so consumed about what's going to happen to us in the future. And that we're, that's where Indians have it over a lot of other people. <laughs> We've been there and, you know, we're not that afraid. And so, but anyway, uh, you know, I grew up on the reserve. I was educated. Uh, I have a mother who, um, 
you know, is an Order of Canada recipient. But she was, she were, she was a janitor when we were growing up, and she, uh, during residential school, she was only allowed to go to school till she was 16. So they were half educated; they couldn't finish high school. So she really placed an emphasis on education, and I think that's part of what we need to be doing as well. Uh, but all of her children, you know, it wasn't that we had this burning desire to get degrees and all of that. It was because we were afraid of our mother, you know. <laughs> Deathly afraid of mother. You go to school, you get up, and, you know, that's it. So, but that, you know, uh, you know aside from that, we, we learned a lot of things about the world, our people, what's happening around the world. And that really benefited my family. And, you know, I, I went to school, got my bachelor's degree, my master's, working on a PhD. But I find myself in this curious position, you know, where I've, I'm lecturing, I've taught everything about Native studies, health. Hell, I was even the police commission chair in our community. <laughs> and I taught all the cops that arrested me, you know. <laughs> But I, you know, uh, I went to, um, you know, I, I was a good girl. You know, I did all the right things. You know, I fulfilled my mother, my people's ambitions. And then I was teaching at the university. I did a lot of theoretical, you know, studying studies about our people. That You know, I, we've been studied to death. So, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'm kind of tired of living in an ivory tower. <laughs> I'm going to go home and go move back to the reserve. So I moved back, and then I began to see that there were so many, the things I taught about, like the conditions, the water, the mold, the poverty, all of that. All of a sudden, I was living them, <laughs> because that's the way it is in many uh, First Nations communities. We don't have a lot of good leadership. We have people, and, and uh, they have the desire. I love you know, our people. But many of them get into this politics for the wrong reasons. In the old days, you served. You didn't get paid you know, to be a traditional chief or a leader. You, know, you did it because you loved what, you know, the, the people and you loved your families. So that's what I, how I was raised. I was raised to be a natural environmentalist. Basic common sense things. I don't need to take a course, you know. I just go, go visit my grandparents, you know. Don't you waste that water, you know. Or, you know, if you don't have to go somewhere, you don't drive over there. You know, like just simple, you know, common sense things. You know, you don't waste food. You know, if you're going to kill an animal, you have to say a prayer, you know, and you don't overhunt or fish. Common sense things. <laughs> so my, I came from that. So when I moved back to the um, reserve, I lived on and off the reserve many years because I have a home there. And I did the same types of things that everybody does. You know, I got mortgages, got the house, the three vehicles, the fur coat. And, you know, I did. I was Calgary's businesswoman of the year, if you can... Imagine, <laughs> in 1989, 90, because I taught people how to use computers. And along the way, I taught people how to, you know, found a lot of our people were sort of illiterate, you know, that were living on the street. So I had to t teach them basic skills. And, you know, so I learn all the time. I don't just teach, I learn a lot. But in terms of moving back to the reserve, I, I started to notice that... Um, our people were swayed by the big oil, by companies like, you know, that would come in and, and want to take over our resources. And we were ripe for the pickings because of our social conditions, because of the poverty. You know, our tribal council signed four agreements, Murphy Oil, Bowood, Quantum, NARP from the U.S., Native American Resources Partners, nothing Native about them, but they're, you know, they go to lands and they <laughs> drill, baby drill, you know. And so I started to notice that, and I was most concerned because I had been teaching, I had been working with people, people like Josh Fox, who produced Gas Lands, a good friend of mine, and... Um, I really started to be concerned because they had, in one of the agreements, they said, we're going to drill a minimum of uh, 200 of these wells, you know, in your community. We have the largest Indian reserve in Canada. 
And we already have about 150 of these on the north end of the reserve. So I thought in one agreement, you got 200 of these. And I mean, those old ones, you know, in the north end were, are ones that were, they didn't produce much, you know, they're kind of ancient. <laughs> but these new ones, you know, the technology that they are going to use to frack, the amount of water, four to nine million gallons of fresh water. We don't have water, you know. Um, but they have all these great thoughts about coming into our communities and doing all these wonderful things, improving our economy. And I remember the Indian Affairs sent this guy out to do a study and we we're gonna have a um, logging and a pulp and paper mill and all of that. You know, I challenge you to find a tree on the blood reserve. There aren't any. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're prairies, you know, we don't have that. And, you know, those were some of the initiatives that the government would try to introduce to our people, you know, and did, didn't make a lot of sense. But getting back to the whole arrest, you know, uh, my husband is a farmer and he was swathing in the, in the region where one of them was coming up. They were going to start fracking. And he asked me to come and give him an aspirin or a couple of aspirins because of the smell, you know, the, the fumes and all of that. So I went looking for him, and I stopped at the site there, and there was a big oil spill, you know, in the middle of the road. And I, I also noted that on most First Nations reserves, there, it's under-regulated or there's no regulation. We have the ERCB, but they're provincial. We have a national energy uh, board, if you will, but I've never seen any of those people. So if there are spills or anything like that with the numbers of wells that were going to come up, there was no, they did an environmental assessment, uh, and I read everything, so I'm kind of um, a thorn in the council's, you know, side, because I read everything, I know my stuff, and they did this environmental assessment, and it was like in the middle of winter, they did, um, there was pictures of snow and uh, tracks, <laughs> and uh, they said that was an environmental assessment, archaeological assessment as well. Middle of winter, all I saw was snow. You know? <laughs> and so these people, it was, it's so bogus, I guess that's what I want to say. You know, the, the standards that we have out here would never, you know, like on the reserve, there's no monitoring, and it's allowed to happen. You look at, uh, you know, some of the organizations that look after us, like Indian Oil and Gas, fracturing or fracking is not even mentioned in any, any of their literature. And when we went to see them, because these agreements were signed without our consent or consultation, can you imagine putting 200 of these in Nanaimo and they don't even ask you? Well, that's what happened in our community. No consultation. So because of that, I said no. You know, I went out there, I said, I want to know what this spill is. What, what are you doing here? They said, and, and the security guard who they hired, those are the only jobs we have on the reserve. Big oil comes in, maybe four or five guys, you know, be sitting at the security desk, maybe digging a few holes for some fences, but no jobs. They promised lots of jobs. Didn't happen. Anyway, I went to the site and I asked them if they were going to start fracking. In the police reports later on in disclosure, the security guard said Lois was there. She was just swearing. <laughs> you know. Yes. Anyway, you know, uh, so I, I said, I'm coming back tomorrow. I want to know what's happening here. And, you know, so I went back there the next day and they sent the police that night. And one of my students, who was one of the constables, he said, Lois, this is a civil matter. We're not getting involved. Here's some water and tobacco. He must have thought I was an elder. But anyhow, <laughs> here's some tobacco. I said, fine, I'll take your tobacco. And um, so the next day, I went back there, and, and uh, they were waiting for us. And I went there by myself. I didn't ask anyone to come, maybe Kathy over here. <laughs> by the way, her husband let her come with me here today, and he says, but please don't get arrested if you're going with us. <laughs> anyway, I kind of go off on a tangent here. Native people tell stories in a circle. You know? <clears throat> I, went, uh, I went back there, and I asked them, what are you doing, and you know, wanted to know. Nobody would knew anything or was going to tell me anything, and there was a whole bunch of frack trucks and all of that. There were 25 that we saw, and here was me standing behind a rope that was their barricade. 
stood there. I never argued with them. I didn't swear at them. I didn't do anything, you know, intimidating. Just standing there with two gals, and we said, we're not moving till we find out. And so the chief, the police said, we're in constant communication with the chief. And you'll remember all of our council signed those oil and gas agreements within 20 minutes of getting those documents without looking at them. But anyway, they phoned the chief and they asked him, <clears throat> you know, what we should do about these women. And, and uh, the constable says, uh, the chief, uh, would you like to meet with him? And I said, yeah. So he phoned back. He says, I can't be there because I'm at a wake in our community. Before the funeral, you have these wakes. And I said, well, maybe perhaps he should attend to the living, you know, <laughs> for a while. <laughs> I wasn't very popular with the chief. <laughs> So I think they, did, you know, they didn't want anybody because I had been for a whole year, I'd been asking, you know, the, what's going on? We had this movement. We had environmental conferences. We knew that there was something coming. So that evening, they, um, they told me, Lois, if you take one more step, and I was behind the barricade, but if you take one more step, we're going to arrest you and charge you with trespassing. And I said, I'm not leaving, I'm not moving till I get some answers. So I took a step, all of a sudden they slapped the handcuffs on me. <laughs> I mean, I was the police commission chair, I used to, you know, <laughs> deal with all this. So they slapped those on me, very tight, by the way, I couldn't even move. And two other gals, we got arrested and they said, we're taking you down to the police cells. And you know, normally I'd be kind of embarrassed a few years ago, humiliated or <laughs> I said, well, you know, I know, my, I know where to go <laughs> around here. And uh, I went and so I was charged, they, I think it was seven hours later, they kept me, us in a cell without charging us. And I think there's, <laughs> you know, you, you're allowed to have at least, uh, you know, some time. Uh, you only have a window of opportunity to charge people, but in our case, we spent the night in jail with this lady who was really intoxicated. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I mean, we just, you know, talked to her, and um, she talked about the conditions in the community and how the chief and council, you know, they weren't doing anything. They got all this oil money and nothing had changed. And, so they uh, charged me, but they didn't charge me with uh, trespassing, which they often charge protesters with. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Trespass. I got charged under the criminal code for intimidation, section 423.1G. <laughs> I remember it so well. 423 is intimidation and blocking a highway. Well, I was in the mid middle of a wheat field. I was not on a highway. <laughs> I mean, really, I was in the middle of the field. And I was not blocking a highway. I was point, you know, parked on the side of the road, and I was standing there just asking questions. And so they made a, a federal case out of it. If you <laughs> so I was charged with that, which meant under Harper's new crime bill that if you're uh, if in Alberta, they set this up. You know, they have a task force and that. If you uh, go against big oil, speak out against the old companies, you could be labeled a terrorist. So I couldn't get on a plane. You know, I couldn't be here. I, yeah, I couldn't cross the border where I was doing my doctoral work. I mean, there was a lot of implications if I was charged under that. And I've, I don't have a criminal record. So I could be scared off. And those were just hearings. They, they didn't give me a trial. They kept sending me back. I don't know why, maybe just to wear me down, but they picked the wrong person because I teach <laughs> criminal justice. <you> know? <laughs> I wrote a manual on, on Aboriginal law and government. You know, <laughs> like I, I think I know my stuff, and I thought, well, get out of the classroom, get out there, and so. <laughs> Seven times I went to hearings and I filed a notice of constitutional question to Ottawa and to Edmonton. Provincial court judges, four of them didn't know what to do with me. Because they said, you know, this is a provincial court. I said, yes, this is a court of, it's not a court of competent jurisdiction. I filed a notice of constitutional. They didn't know what to do with me. It was so funny to watch. But, anyway. <laughs> but I, as I was in court, I noticed that 99% of the people that were in court on Monday morning were Indian. Yeah. And none of them ever 
in the how many, there was 80 cases sometimes on a Monday morning, seven times, do the math, you know, nobody ever pled not guilty or stood up for themselves. They had legal aid people, you know, get up for them. And the two other gals that I was with, um, you know, they kind of got scared off. They were young girls, and I understand. They didn't, didn't want But they got scared, and, and um, if I speak out, my, this lawyer is threatening to sue me for speaking out because, because I said I wasn't going to be to plead out, you know. And she put the fear of God in these people. And um, I went on Facebook and I said she was a bottom feeding la lazy lawyer, and she sent a letter to, via uh, her lawyer that she was going to sue me. So I thought, well, you know, because that's all I saw in the courthouse. These people, uh, you know, every file, legal aid, you know, plead them out, plead them out, plead them out. It's a big business. Aboriginal people are the bread and butter of the justice system, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, you know, and I don't mean to offend anyone, but that's the fact. You know, if you look at the statistics, do, how much time do I have? Two minutes. <laughs> Shucks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just getting back, I saw that this was a much bigger issue than just Lois Frank going to jail or, you know, just standing in front of some frack trucks or whatever. It involved federal with Harper and his agenda, the crime bill, the oil and gas, us being in Alberta. You think others are unpopular in this country. You, if you live in Alberta, you know, it's uh, Saudi Arabia of uh, North America. But... I dealt with the provincial, federal, tribal governments, justice, the courts, the police, all the oil companies. I realized that I was kind of in a lot of hot water with a lot of these. <laughs> and um, I, I guess what, what happened was, you know, I just kept going and I said, I'm not, I'm not guilty of anything. So. Yeah. So I went armed, June 20th, with my papers, my maps, you know, everything. That I finally got a lawyer because they said, we're not going to hear this till you at least, we, we feel better if you have a lawyer. So I got Ig, my friend Ig Palecki came and helped me out. Uh, but what happened was they, they dropped the charge, they didn't drop them, they withdrew the charges and they said, but to save face, we're going to stay the charges so that we have one year in case you do anything, we can come back. That was justice for me. It's, the, the, the system is um, a legal system. It's not a justice system, as we uh, know. So just to end off, you know, if you give me the mic, I'll be here all night. But <laughs> three things. You know, growing up, um, like my doctoral work is in environmental leadership. And I thought, I've been studying this stuff forever. Like, take the lead, do something, you know. So, you know, growing up, I was always, be careful what you, how you talk to your children, label them and that. And growing up, you know, I was, I was always called bossy, and now it's a, I'm a good organizer, you know, a good manager. <laughs> when I was growing up, too, I was pushy. The teacher said I was pushy. Now I'm very assertive. <laughs> and um, I realized that in order to do this kind of work, you have to be fearless. There is nothing else. You have to have the courage. You have to be fearless in spite of all of this. And we need each other. We need to, if somebody is doing this kind of work, donate, uh, you know, to their campaigns or to whatever. Call them up. Because I felt very alone many times because... You know, but once this happened and I was arrested and charged, it went viral all over the world. I was getting calls from everywhere, you know, South Africa, New Zealand, Ireland, all over the U.S. People knew about it, and that's the social media. So in order to be fearless, you know, you, you can break systems if you're fearless, and I learned that. And like I say, Bill said, you know, don't throw these 22-year-olds because, you know, we have to, as you know, citizens of this country, and I'll leave you with this, because um, we had this uh, conference and we had these t-shirts, and t-shirts are nice, you know, if you don't spend a lot of money on ads and campaigns and that. Like, this was our first t-shirt, and my son's a boxer, and so he designed this. 
a Kainai Earth Watch environmental conference. It has a picture of an Indian, one tough Indian, boxing where he had to throw that in, Rocky, you know, <laughs> low budget boxer. And it says, don't frack with us. <laughs> Last thing, just last thing. You know, in our community, women, you know, uh, have become very disrespected. When you think, you know, we live in patriarchal societies, by and large, in First Nations communities, and people said, geez, you know, you know, you've, on the, the, these counselors, these other people, you know, they're calling you guys bitches, you know. <laughs> and so one of my, uh, some of my girlfriends said, Bitches stands for being in total control, honey. <laughs> Thank you.